Hi, this is Dee Dee River. Um, I wanted to share some thoughts about identity politics. Um, we've heard a lot about identity politics lately. Um, I've seen Debbie Lusignan from saying progressives attacking identity politics. I've seen articles from um, the Jacobin attacking identity politics. I've seen things in Counterpunch attacking identity politics. And it seems to be a bit of a theme at the moment. So I wanted to consider what identity politics really means and where this is coming from. Um, my own perception is that it's generally an attack on people whose identity and demands for justice around those identities are problematic for the mainstream. And by the mainstream, I mean basically white, cis, het people. Um, men, if, uh, if you want to include women in terms of identities that people don't like. Uh, and I think the whole thing uh, of the attack on identity politics is akin to the Twitter attack that was done against Black Lives Matter um, as hashtag all lives matter. Now, Cornel West did a wonderful uh, blog about that, where uh, I think the title was actually Black Lives Matter because all lives matter. And that perspective makes complete sense. But the assumption there is that if we identify as human beings and we have a commitment to justice, then any oppression of any human beings, including black human beings, becomes an issue for us as human beings that um, we would object strongly to the treatment of black people because we object to that kind of treatment of people. It's a sense of the colorblind that says, well, if we're truly colorblind, then the attacks on black people and the oppression of black people is my issue regardless of my race. And unless people are taking that attitude, then colorblindness starts meaning I don't see your oppression. Um, I'm going to say it doesn't apply to everybody, and so it doesn't apply. We'll just forget it. It's a little small group somewhere over to the side uh, and unimportant. And the attack on identity politics has parallels to that. The um, identities that people are chiefly worried about are identities like black, people of color, uh, lesbian and gay people, trans people, um, all of those weird people who are making demands on the mainstream. That's because they're being oppressed by the mainstream. The thing to recognize is that people accused of identity politics don't call what they're doing identity politics. That's not what they say. That's not their phrase. That's not their words. That's the words of people who consider themselves mainstream about them. And it's a pejorative term used effectively to attack those people. Um, the attacks are that they are divisive, that they don't apply to everybody, that 
they um, are just they they basically say that these people want something special for themselves the reality is these people want a basic sense of justice and when i say these people i'm talking about me as well um, as a member of a few different oppressed groups um, I would be one of those people who's being attacked um, for identity politics. Um, calls for unity um, really beg the question of unity around what? What kind of unity are we asking for? What issues are we asking to be unified around? And if the answer is class and economics, so that the issues become health care and uh, taxation and you know, employment and that kind of thing in general, then you're basically putting all of the other issues into the shadows. And if you really want unity, one of the first things you're going to need to do is address those people whose oppression is uh, most obvious, who those people whose oppression is greatest. Because if you're not addressing their oppression, you're not going to have unity with those people, and you are not going to be on side with them. And what I see happening is that there is uh, a concerted movement to marginalize oppressed minorities and oppressed groups generally. I mean, in the case of women, it's not even a minority. Uh, in the case of you know, people overseas in other countries, it's certainly not a minority. Um, but there's a certain segment at the left that is trying to push those people into the margins and say their issues are divisive, their issues are unimportant, and this should be seen along the lines of the hashtag white lives matter movement uh, or the people who are opposed to political correctness now the opposition to political correctness is another reactive thing by people who essentially want to be a bit racist or sexist or whatever um, admittedly people can go overboard sometimes with um, maybe particular claims of oppression or whatever but you know people are really being oppressed people are actually um, being damaged by racist slurs and sexist slurs and homophobic slurs, transphobic slurs. These are real things. Treating people with contempt is never really okay. And to sit there and go, oh, this is just political correctness when somebody behaves badly. Um, this is uh, basically an attack on groups that are being oppressed. The identity politics attack contextually is exactly the same sort of thing. In that context, it is an attack on people who 
um, really are you know, just struggling to fight oppression. Most of the identities that people take up, so-called identities, like black or gay or lesbian or trans or something, are identities that people have been oppressed under. The anti-black uh, oppression and discrimination and all of that history against black people, not only in the United States where it's particularly nasty, but elsewhere around the world. I mean, you see the same sort of thing with the North Africans in France, with um, you know, different groups everywhere. Um, you know, you see it with the Turks in Germany, um, where they, you know, highlight the, their dark skin and this sort of thing. Even though, you know, I don't know, you know, whether a lot of people would be able to identify a Turk as alien, unless they have a really, really, really white background. Um, by white, I mean Anglo-Saxon, Nordic, Germanic um, background, because the difference between a Turk and somebody who is Spanish or somebody who is Southern Italian or somebody who is Greek or somebody who is from the Balkans, you know, it's not easy to see. But then all of those groups uh, around the Mediterranean have been subject to discrimination at one time or another as well um, and considered olive skin or dark skinned or whatever. All of these things are tools of oppression. They're something that's been kind of made up by ruling classes, it's true. And it's been applied to people and those people have experienced that oppression. The oppression has been done on that basis. And so things like the Black Lives Matter, the anti-racist movements and stuff have crystallized around that, around people who you know, are tired of being discriminated against in those ways. And they turn and say, yes, I'm black, I'm a person of color, I'm whatever, or in the case of lesbian and gay people, you have the situation where, you know, they people have been called perverts and faggots and dykes and all this sort of stuff. For years, they've been marginalized and oppressed and discriminated against on those bases. And people finally got together and said, okay, we're being discriminated as this. We are going to fight against this discrimination as this, as gay, as lesbian, as uh, queer, as trans, as whatever. And so identities of resistance are formed. And these identities of resistance, I mean, it's, you know, obvious that, you know, people, for instance, in the black community, the idea that everybody is unif, there's some sort of unity um, among people of color, uh, you know, or even black, with people who are biracial, multiracial, all of that sort of thing. Um, there's differences. There's differences between people from Western Africa, from Central Africa, from Southern. Yeah, people are different. They're, they're different ethnicities. They look different. They have slightly different features or coloring or whatever. The thing is, 
in terms of oppression, the oppressors see them all as black. And so in terms of resistance, the identity is that they are all black. So Black Lives Matter, uh, black activism, the Black Panthers, that resistance um, doesn't and shouldn't break into these little attempts at policing who is black enough, because that's counterproductive. The resistance in black or whatever is the resistance to the oppressing, oppression that sees all of these people as black. The same thing is true with the LGBTI community. All of these people are seen as queer. Um, to a degree, all of it is seen as an attack on gender because the earliest descriptions of gay and lesbian people and the earliest attacks was always on the basis, or, or almost always on the basis, of their um, gender expressions. Yeah. And who they have as sexual partners has been perceived by Kraft Ebbing and Freud and various people in terms of inverts, in terms of having the wrong genders, sexual attraction. And it's only been as that community gets stronger and more self-assertive and more people that are, uh, are included in that community that we start to see internal differentiation because there are differences between lesbian people and gay people and um, bi people and you know, men who have sex with men and you know, um, effeminate people and um, masculine women, effeminate men, um, gender diversity, uh, transgender, non-binary, all of these things, as people look to define themselves in some ways, these distinctions make, yeah, make some difference to their experience. But in terms of the oppression, they're all seen as perverts, they're all seen as wrong. All of the people in the LGBT community, which is my community, so we are all seen as wrong. We're all queer, we're all perverts. We're all wrong in some way. And so that's why you know, the LGBTI community is LGBTIQ, whatever other initials you want to put, or gender and sexual diversity, or some other umbrella term, because in terms of the, quote, mainstream, we're all, in a sense, oppressed in the same way by the same group. Um, when people start attacking identity politics, what they mean is queer identities, black identities, identities like you know, the feminist identities as women. These are these groups that are making demands for the end of oppression on the mainstream. And these are the groups that people want to silence in a way. They feel that these people are a diversion from the real task that applies to everybody, which is effectively uh, a class one. Now, class issues definitely matter. Uh, health care and issues like that matter. But health care and those matters also affect all of the groups differently. It affects 
trans people differently, it affects LGBTI people differently, it affects black people differently, it affects everybody in a different way. And while there can be unity and common cause, if the mainstream aren't willing to recognize the oppression uh, of other groups, then there will be no unity. The only way you have real unity, the only way you transcend the identities, is when you incorporate the agendas of those identities, those identities of resistance that are fighting their, the oppression, the identity-based oppression, um, and you incorporate those into a general human rights um, stance. Or if you include veganism, a general sentient being's rights stance that no one should be used, no one should be oppressed, no one should be being killed um, you know, in, in the way, you know, black people are being killed in the way, you know, it's, and part of that needs to be, needs to go beyond the nation state, and it needs to be recognized that the nation state is part of the problem. And so U.S. centric oppression and U.S. centric issues need to take cognizance of wider oppression, the oppression by the United States of people all around the world. Um, a good example of that is the, the recent um, issue with transgender people where um, sorry, I'm fiddling with the phone just a little bit because uh, the sun is coming in at a strange angle and so on. Um, but the trans people's ban for the military, okay, it's important for um, trans people to be treated equally. Um, I'm <laughs> absolutely in favor of that. But if somebody organized a death squad and said, oh, but transgender people can't join, uh, can't be members of the death squad, are trans people really going to go, oh, this is discrimination. I want to belong to that death squad. The United States military is like that. And there has been a huge effort since the Vietnam War um, to portray the United States military in favorable lights. You know, it started with the, well, we shouldn't discriminate against the troops. I'm against the war, but I'm not against the troops. And uh, this sort of morphs into a support our troops and all, Anybody in the military is a hero and a patriot and they are defending us all. And, and that kind of language and that kind of perception is a co-option of consideration of people to feed the propaganda and patriotism around the U.S. military. The U.S. military is all over the world since World War II. It's been engaged in countless battles, and virtually all of them have been interference or invasions of other nations. They haven't been fighting for freedom. The United States has supported dictators and opposed democracies. It has overthrown democracies. It, is, it supports and, and 
puts into place kings who are absolute monarchs, the Sauds, the uh, um, Shah of Iran, it has supported dictators like Pinochet and General Somoza and Noriega and, and so on. They are counter-democracy. They are counter-freedom because it's much easier for them to deal with a single strong man who has power, who they can gain support of, who they can support and use. And when they do this, they um, democracy interferes because the interests of people in most developing countries are not served by opening their borders to global capital. And the United States government serves global capital. Um, and so they put into place programs like you know, to provide housing for people, to provide free education, to provide health. And this is something people like Gaddafi and Assad and other people have pursued. Um, the Sandinista revolution against, um, uh, God, what's his name? Here, just a minute ago, having a senior moment. Um, anyway, the, the, the Sandinista re revolution overthrew uh, a dictator, and it was fundamentally a union between the working class and the middle class, um, initially, certainly. And um, the U.S. basically, by supporting um, General Somoza um, and opposing the Sandinistas, forced them in the direction of the communist states at that time because they were the only people who would trade with them thanks to the US sanctions and so on. I don't think their inclination was necessarily to go in that direction um, they wanted to be able to trade, they wanted to have a democracy. But they were pushed that way and the whole Contra, you know, US funded Contra, uh, so-called rebels, um, the basically terrorists who the US fund, um, I, it was a disgrace. It was absolutely anti-democratic. It was absolutely in the service of trying to put in some sort of autocracy that the United States would feel comfortable with, that it could supply with you know, weapons and with aid and instruction from people who were experts at torture and interrogation and so on. And this is one of the functions of the, the CIA and, and people like that. You know, they have provided, you know, tortures and you know, all kinds of assistance in that way to death squads and, you know, juntas and, uh, right-wing generals all through Latin America. They want to maintain their absolute dominance in Latin America. And the price of that is generally to be anti-democratic because the people are really not interested in being dominated by the United States. They don't see it as an advantage. They see the United States as you know, the bloody Yankees, the gringos, the shitheads who invade, who, you know, um, 
interfere, who involve themselves in regime change, who are responsible for blowing up presidential palaces like uh, with Allende uh, in the other 9-11. Um, the United States, the people who, who uh, routinely go around the world and defend their interests in somebody else's country, in Vietnam, in Korea, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Panama, in you know, it doesn't matter where, in Libya, you know, and what makes these places U.S. interests? These are sovereign nations. The United States military is uh, an imperialist army of invasion and domination. And serving in the United States military is not an honorable profession. Anybody who volunteers to be in that is culpable, is culpable for the crimes that they involve themselves in because it's bloody obvious what the United States military is doing. Uh, the people who returned, the soldiers who returned from Vietnam, you know, weren't greeted you know, with great uh, joy and respect, in large parts because the people in the United States realized that, you know, going halfway around the world to meddle in some other country's politics and try to stop the insurgents who were the population who were trying to overthrow a corrupt regime, the DM regime, um, is not the right thing to do. You know, slaughtering villages, you know, blowing up villages, killing children, killing, you know, uh, women, grandparents, old people, young people. This isn't right. I mean, this wasn't an uh, you know like a, an army in the the European you know twentieth century um, sort of or or nineteenth century sense. Um, this wasn't a war. This was a, a, a huge power meddling on behalf of a dictator in somebody else's nation and going halfway around the world. There was no war. I mean, the Vietnamese were never going to attack America. They were never going to attack the United States. The United States was at no risk from the Vietnamese. You know, the Vietnamese peasantry were trying to overthrow a dictator. The United States was in there trying to support that dictator. But that Vietnamese peasantry were never a threat to the United States. And the United States has been involved in war after war after war after war in somebody else's country where those, whether, whether they lose or uh, win, um, you know, the Viet Vietnamese may be said to have won the Vietnam War. That country was devastated. I mean, you can call it a victory, but that country was devastated. Their winning the war meant the United States bloody left. It didn't mean anything happened to the United States. No parts of the United States were damaged. There were no bombed cities in the United States. There were no defoliated forests in the United States. There were no civilians killed in the United States. It's just that their army was defeated. And this is the problem. The United States has, has played the bully boy and gone to nation after nation where they could walk into these places and 
kill people, kill civilians, kill you know, their armies, kill whoever they wanted, and do whatever they wanted because of their military force. This is a might makes right situation. And they never had to really worry. I mean, they might lose some troops, but what were those troops doing there? There was never any threat to a U.S. city. There were never any threat to U.S. civilians. There might be a threat to the U.S. invaders, yeah, you know, because people do fight back. If you come and invade my country, you know, I'm liable to, to try and resist. And some of you people are liable to get hurt. But, um, you know, it's not a threat to the United States. You know, Nicaragua, Panama, Iraq, Syria, Libya, they're not threats to the United States. You know, Afghanistan is not a threat. The Afghanis are not going to attack U.S. cities. Yeah. There's no reason to bomb Iraq into rubble to protect the United States. What the hell are they protecting? And to claim, to start the dialogue that, that these people are um, heroes. They're not heroes. They're criminals. They rape people. They shoot people. They shoot children. They shoot old people. Yeah, U.S. now, their big thing is no boots on the ground. They don't want any of their precious soldiers injured. They want to be able to devastate cities and turn them into rubble and kill a million people with no casualties. That's their goal. This is not a, 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 a worthy goal. This is not an acceptable goal. This is horrible criminal crimes against other nations. And to serve in this voluntarily, you're culpable. All of the soldiers out there, they're culpable. They're not there by accident, they joined. And you can say that the social system in the United States is so poor, their health care is so poor, their access to education is so poor that they are crushing their own people to such a degree that the only way socially those people can get by or one big option for them to get ahead is to join the U.S. military. That's not an excuse. And the whole thing, I, I've seen thing after thing about uh, uh, article on the webs and videos and stuff talking about trans soldiers and how they've, you know, trans people, you know, should have the right to, to defend their countries and their patriots and their heroes. No. I'm sorry, they're just like all the other people who, who've joined up and, and look the other way and shoot people and kill people and kill children and kill grandparents and kill, you know, engineers and bakers and, and, and lawyers and doctors and bomb hospitals and bomb schools it's not okay. It's not okay. They're, you're not heroes, you people. Yeah. And trans people should go, no. No. Yeah. We're not going to be part of this. Um, you can keep us out, and that's discriminatory, and that's an example of this, but there's plenty of other areas of discrimination against trans people that can be fought. And 
the problem with fighting, and I've seen this with the, the, the LGBTI community too, the, the gay and lesbian community, and the don't ask, don't tell, I mean, it always falls back on that rhetoric of heroes and, and defending, you know, their country and, you know, putting themselves in harm's way. Putting themselves in harm's way, they run over, you know, dropping bombs on a peasant culture isn't putting yourself in harm's way. It's a war crime. Shooting children because they might be insurgents is a war crime. You invading other countries is a war crime. It's not right. It's the worst kind of, of, of action. And it doesn't make you a hero. And, and you're not defending the United States because these people have no capacity to attack the United States. I mean, if you keep destroying their lives, destroying their, their cities, their infrastructure, their ability to have sewage, their ability to have water, their ability to have a hospital or a school, and you just smash the whole thing uh, to ruin, there will be people who are driven to such a level of despair and anger that on individual basis they may want to strike back. And the only way they may be able to, to strike back is in some suicidal action where they say, well, fuck you. I'm going to take some of you shitheads with, you, with me. And, you know, you can't blame them, really. What would you do? I mean, you see... Uh, movie after movie, American movie after movie, where the poor benighted someone or other steps up and, 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 and kills all of the mafia or the bad guys or the, you know, the aliens or the zombies or the whatever. They're defending the right, you know, all of the kung fu movies where my brother was hurt and so I'm going to take out everybody, the crow, all this stuff. It's all, you know, vigilante, I'm going to get them all, you know, violence. Um, I don't see a lot of difference between that and a suicide bomber, really. Um, a suicide bomber mm, takes out innocent victims. That's true. That's because they can't generally get to the people who are actually responsible. And I think they just get frustrated and say, you keep killing my people, you keep killing my children, my parents, my friends, my family, you know, everybody I know. Well, some of you should die too. I don't think it's a justification of suicide bombing. But I think we can understand how people can be driven to that and not claim that an individual being driven to this is an excuse to invade a nation and destroy cities and kill millions of people. And yeah, soldiers are not defending America. And soldiers who are invading these places are not heroes. And they're not, you know, it's only patriotism in the sense that, you know, the Nazi troops were patriots. The, you know, Roman legions were patriots. They're feeding the empire. 
Yeah. The conquistadors weren't patriots. They were invaders. Um, the army needs to be understood in those terms that it's not all right. These people aren't heroes. Now, many of those people as individuals actually come to see how, how terrible um, these wars of aggression are because the people who get involved in war as soldiers, I have great sympathy for many of them. I don't think they're heroes. I don't think they are defending anybody. But I have great sympathy for them because when I was working, when I was living in the United States, I worked a lot with the anti-Vietnam War movement and did a lot of work with the Vietnam vets against the war. And there's a lot of veteran organizations against the war. And there are more people in the U.S. military who die by suicide than are killed by enemy combatants. And a lot of that has to do with their experiences in these wars. And a lot of people have PTSD, and a lot of people have seen horrible things and participated in horrible things. And they understand that. And I have great sympathy for those people. But they're not heroes. And there's no reason trans people should have to be in that situation. There's no reason anybody should have to be in that situation. Um, and so this, you know, push for the, the trans equality thing needs to be cognizant of that. It needs to, to understand this in a contextual way that these things are not great. Hi, I'm back again. Um, I've had a little technical glitch. And uh, anyway, I was saying that um, I have great sympathy for people in the military. And a lot of trans people have served in the military, but a lot of those have been trans women, and a lot of them have been in the military um, in hyper-masculine positions like Navy SEALs and uh, Rangers and Green Berets and that sort of thing, in order in part to deny their, their, their gender uh, issues. And uh, there's been a fair bit of um, research and work about that. Um, a number of trans people have said things like that. Um, and they've been in the military generally until they've needed to transition, or they've transitioned after they've left the military. But um, there hadn't been very many people who've been serving as trans, a few lately, and even so, I, I don't think that means that it's a good thing. Given what the American military is and does, it's not a good thing. Um, people, particularly people who are struggling and who uh, enter the military for educational health and other kind of benefits, um, often find that you know, their treatment is not fabulous. 
Um, since women have been allowed into the military, there's been a very large number of rapes by um, male soldiers, their fellow combatants, their fellow troops um, who are raping women soldiers. Um, that's been something of a scandal. It's pretty well documented. The treatment of troops, the use of National Guard, the improper or the, the inadequacy of equipment, the need for them to sometimes purchase their own equipment, the um, treatment of veterans after they come back, the denial of a lot of mental health issues, PTSD and so on, which are huge. Uh, there's a huge number of people suffering from PTSD um, as a consequence of their service. And when you have that kind of um, outcomes, it's not a fabulous place to be. A lot of veteran groups and even politicians routinely um, bring up the issue of the treatment of veterans. It's not good. Basically, people are seen as expendable. They're cannon fodder, and the use of unscrupulous techniques in recruitment, the programs like Stop Loss, the mm, dishonesty of um, people where they uh, recruiters particularly, whether they tell people they're going to be able to serve here or do this or learn this, and then they find themselves being put into a war zone and uh, their terms of service there come to an end and they're just kept there under the stop-loss program. All of these are fairly notorious situations. People who are at a disadvantage and trying socially to gain some advantage through being in the American military are treated as cannon fodder. They're not treated well afterwards. There's a lot of lip service uh, in terms of, oh, our heroes, our defenders, uh, you know, veterans are not treated well. Um, and I have huge sympathy for those people. And a lot of them you know, the stories they tell about the actual nature of service. I mean, you look at the dronings and things like that, the dronings of wedding parties that will take out 50 civilians in the hopes of getting somebody, and they target a mobile phone, and that person who, whose mobile phone they think they're targeting may not even be there. A relative may have the phone on them, and so an entire wedding party gets droned, or a funeral. Yeah. And we're not talking about, you know, five or six people. We're talking about 40, 50 people hit with a hellfire missile who are non-combatants, who are in, in a completely different country, a country we're not even supposed to be, like Yemen, where we were not even supposed to be involved in it. Uh, all of this is done in the name of the war on terror, which is an excuse to have perpetual warfare and attack anyone, anywhere, with no respect for any kind of sovereignty, with no declaration of war, with no real oversight. It allows the government of the United States to do basically anything it wants, anywhere it wants, anytime it wants, and to continue... Uh, on and on and on. And this is not what we should be supporting. And yet the narratives you hear from people pushing for trans rights to be in the military are all about you know, serving their country and patriotism and defending their people. And it glorifies the military and it makes it look like it's okay, and it makes it look like it's, a, it's an honorable thing to do. And it's not. I can understand why, for socioeconomic reasons, people might do it. 
I can understand that people are swayed by propaganda and might get sucked in. Neither of those really justify the American military. Neither of those justify supporting a machine which routinely goes to various countries in the world and invades and destroys and supports dictators in Syria. They're supporting Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, whatever you want to call it. You know, they're, they're probably feeding into ISIS. They're certainly supporting all kinds of basically radical fundamentalist Sunni jihadists because you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy is Assad, who is a popularly elected uh, president. He's been one of the few people he's seen as, a, as somebody who can keep stability in an area where there are these groups, which anywhere else, the United States, you know, would consider them terrorist groups. Uh, if, if they weren't using them as allies, they would be considered terrorist groups by the United States right now. Uh, the United States feels free to invade other countries on the pretext of stopping such groups, but the United States is funding these groups in order to overthrow a secular government that seeks to, uh, and, and has actually been reasonably successful at dealing with a population which is has great diversity in terms of religion, uh, ethnicity, and all sorts of things. I mean, Syria has the oldest Christian churches in the world. Um, their religion, um, Christian, Christian religious groups that followed from Peter in the days after Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in, in 55 AD. You know, the people moved to Syria, and that's, you know, they are the oldest Christians anywhere. The Alawatis, there's all sorts of groups and, and a huge amount of diversity. And the Assad government has managed to maintain a level of peace and security and provide housing and education and, and health care. Um, before the war, it was seen as one of the most progressive countries in, in terms of that. It's just like Libya. I mean, Libya provided free education um, to people, including overseas education. It wasn't just in Libya. They, they provided free housing. Now, they provide, they provide all kinds of benefits, you know, health care and so on, for the people. They used the oil that they were producing and took those profits and used them for the people. And it's true that both the Assad government and Gaddafi's government are to a degree command economies. You know, they don't just let transnational corporations come in and buy up all the resources and, and use people as, as dirt cheap labor. No, they try and build, they were trying to build industries, build up the population, make sure it was an educated population, make sure they got adequate health care, make sure they had housing. And they were doing this reasonably well. And look at the situation in Libya now. It's been virtually destroyed. And now the U.S. is moving in because they have oil. You know, all of the benefits that Gaddafi was providing were provided um, based on sale of oil. Well, now there's a total mess in Libya. So the U.S. is moving in and it will be able to control the oil because this is what 
a lot of it is about. It's control of resources. And the idea that you can be a part of this, yeah, it's not defense. It's not defense of the United States. Uh, Libya was never an, a threat to the United States. Um, the Assad government is not a threat to the United States. They don't like them because they, they have had issues with them because they are basically a social democracy. They're not a socialist country. They're a social democracy more like Sweden. They, they have uh, national industry plans and things like that. They want to promote their own industry. They don't want to just see, like in Australia, all the industry just vanish and us become a mine and, and, uh, um, and farm for other nations and then have other global capitalist corporations come in and own the mines and own the farms and, you know, how much comes back to the Australian people? Um, very few jobs, very little money, you know, it's, it's a disgrace. Um, we used to have industry policy um, but that interferes with global capitalism and places like Libya and Syria and places where they had secular governments that were trying to do things for the people and trying to develop industries and develop their housing and develop their education and develop these things develop their resource industry in a way that would benefit the nation. And this is the issue, of course, in Latin America, too. You know, people want, they don't want, you know, big global corporations to own all the resources and, and, and benefit, and nothing comes back to the people. Um, well, the U.S. military serves this. The U.S., this is what the U.S. military is doing. It's not defending U.S. people. The only U.S. people who are harmed are invaders, basically, who, who, have, who have invaded some other country. Um, and trans people need to understand this context. They need to understand the context that, you know, the military soldiers are used as cannon fodder, that many soldiers recognize that what is being done uh, in the name of U.S. is horrific, you know, that their enemies um, are ordinary people, you know, are mothers and grandfathers and little girls and, you know, these are the enemy. These are the insurgents. And, you know, you're just killing the population is what you're doing. And of course they're going to resent it. And of course they're going to fight back. And that's what makes them insurgents. But they're not an army. Yeah. They're not really an army at all. They're not going to harm anybody half a world away in the United States. You know, the, the streets of Kansas City are absolutely safe from Afghani peasants. Um, yeah, it's... It, we need to be aware. I'm, I'm sorry I've gotten off on this, but it's, it's an issue um, with trans people at the moment um, where trans discrimination seems to be in conflict with wider issues. And that happens. Going back to identity politics, that can happen if people are not being aware. But the general attacks 
on identity politics are not about that kind of understanding or contextualizing conflicts and competing claims um, of oppression. They're not into, you know, the oppression of trans people versus the oppression of most of the rest of the world, um, or U.S. trans people versus most of the rest of the world, because in most of the rest of the world, or on much of the rest of the world, trans people can serve in militaries, you know, in Canada or Australia or places like that. Um, yeah, that kind of distinction is not what's being made when we hear people talking about identity politics in a sneering way. They're talking about a, a desire to dismiss the demands of people with identities like trans people and LGBTI people, gay and lesbian people, um, women, black people, people of color, pretty much anyone uh, who they don't feel fits the mainstream narrative. And somehow the mainstream narrative devolves back to white, cisgendered, heterosexual, generally men. And the attack on identity politics is an attack on oppressed groups trying to resist the oppression and trying to raise their own issues. And that kind of thing is not helping any kind of progressive thing and it, it will not create any kind of unity. What it does is actually works to fragment um, any kind of social movement wider social movement, any kind of alliances between groups, because I think there are many people like the Black Peace Alliance. I mean, I, I look at Black Lives Matter or the Black Peace Alliance and people like that, and you see the issues they raise, they include things like Palestine and Syria and, and all of these kind of things they're actually quite aware of some of this global oppression. They incorporate that. They, you know, they are aware that while black people are being shot and killed and oppressed and thrown into the prison industrial complex and criminalized and, and all of these awful things that are happening, they're also aware that one of the biggest percentage-wise levels of fatalities and attacks are, are um, black transgender people and sex workers, black sex workers, and particularly black transgender sex workers. And, you know, they don't worry about including those people. They can be black and, and, and include information about and, and fight for black issues and yet be fighting for human issues, fighting for oppression uh, against oppression for other groups. They recognize the oppression in a wider context. I mean, it, it isn't a mistake that the... the uh, people who really started um, the Black Lives Matter are, are, are two women. Um, it's, it's possible <laughs> to be fighting for your against your particular oppression and still be aware and happy to fight against other oppression. 
um, there is nothing that stops a black person fighting against black oppression, to be fighting against trans oppression, to be fighting against the oppression of sex workers, to be fighting against the oppression of, of uh, um, the Palestinian people, to be fighting against uh, various global issues. Um, and they do. They, they will fight against oppression on many, many fronts, all fronts, and they are not unaware of class issues, and they are, and, and they're, the things that they write and the things that they say, there's no lack of awareness of class issues. There is no lack of awareness of the division uh, in terms of wealth. There's no lack of awareness of how global capitalism um, destroys people in order to to wring every last cent out of everyone and to maximize the exploitation of people and, and the environment. They know these things. It's included in what they're writing. They're not uh, divisive at all. The people who are truly divisive are the people who are attacking identity politics and who are attacking black people and trans people and gay and lesbian people and women as being divisive and concerned only with themselves. That's not the case. It's a lie and it's basically a tool to disempower those people and to disempower, to, to try and reduce the impact and the unity fighting these forms of oppression. And so I'm happy to call out all these people who, who are going on about identity politics as basically servants of, of oppression. I think that's what they are. I think that's what this is about. I think identity politics is just code word for all those minority groups we don't want to think about. That's in quotes. I'm a member of those minority groups and I do think about them. Yeah, I think there is nothing contradictory between fighting for the interest of or, or fighting the oppression that impacts your group um, or, or groups you have membership in and fighting oppression in general and fighting for all groups. Um, going back to the Corner West thing that uh, Black Lives Matter because, because all lives matter. All of these issues matter because human rights and the rights of all sentient beings matter. And so anybody who considers themselves a real human being or real sentient being should be fighting oppression anywhere because as many people have said, oppression anywhere is really oppression against everyone. Okay, that probably do. Um, uh, <laughs> I've taken a long time. It's a beautiful day. I'm just starting to do these podcasts. Hopefully I'll be doing more of them. Um, okay, I hope everybody has a lovely day, evening, whatever. I hope all of you are actively working to end oppression. And that's all I have to say. Keep fighting. <laughs> Don't please think, though, about what actually you're fighting for. Okay, thanks. Bye.